namaste and good evening i swati solanki researcher and assistant editor at impri impact and policy research institute prabhav evam niti anusandhan sansthan nai delhi extend my warmest welcome to you all to impri hashtag web policy talk today we have gathered for a special lecture on feminist jurisprudence and gender bias within family laws by flavia agnes as a part of the series the state of gender equality hashtag #gender gaps the series is organized by impri gender impact studies center it is my privilege to introduce our chair for today's discussion professor vibhuti patel hello namaste ma'am is visiting professor at impri and a former professor at tata institute of social sciences mumbai with the permission of our chair i would like to introduce the speaker for today's session yes swati please introduce the speaker thank you ma'am our speaker today is flavia agnes ma'am is women's rights lawyer and co-founder and director at majlis legal center mumbai we welcome you ma'am thank you thank you as discussants we have with us anuradha kapoor ma'am is director at swayam kolkata we welcome you ma'am thank you audrey de melo ma'am is director at majlis legal center mumbai a very uh, warm welcome ma'am and sanchita ayn who is partner at asv legal and an advocate on record in the supreme court of india very warm welcome ma'am my heartiest welcome to you all for today's pertinent talk now i would like to invite our chair professor vibhuti patel to initiate the discussion and invite our speaker and panelist taking the discussion forward we really look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering today ma'am over to you thank you thank you swati uh, and first of all i would like to express my heartfelt thanks to dr arjun kumar and impri team uh, both swati solanki and sakshi sharda for uh, for for giving us opportunity to use the impri platform for such an important discussion as feminist jurisprudence and gender bias in the family laws i would like to greet advocate flavia flavia agnes ms anuradha kapoor advocate sanchita ayn and advocate audrey de mello uh, who are here on the panel and they are going to share uh, their experiences and provide the analytical uh, understanding of the feminist jurisprudence feminist movement has found simultaneous existence of constitutional guarantees of equality and non discrimination on the one hand and religion based family discriminatory personal laws uh, on the other as uh, they are that are institutionalizing gender inequality uh, they are most baffling and by providing institutional support to women facing problems concerning marriage divorce maintenance alimony property rights custody of child and children or uh, guardianship rights right to stay in a parental and matrimonial homes feminists realize that existing personal laws and most of the customary laws uh, were and are discriminatory uh, towards women and they violate women's right to a dignified life over last four decades women's rights movement has consistently fought for gender justice within the family laws in the streets and the feminist lawyers have fought legal battles in the courtrooms now feminist jurisprudence commands a great respect among progressive citizens as well as among the section of judiciary in india before 2005 hindu daughters were deprived of coparsonary rights in the parental property as per the codes of pitakshara before amendment in the christian divorce act in 2001 uh christian women could not get divorce on ground of husband's adultery it had to be coupled with cruelty bestiality and sodomy at the same time double standards of sexual morality in our society allowed christian husbands to get divorce just by declaring their wives as adulteresses this antiquated laws were enacted in the colonial period to serve the interest of british bureaucrats who had their legally wedded wives in england and were cohabiting with indian in their language native uh, subaltern women uh, parsi daughters who married non parsi men lost their property rights and non parsi wives uh, of parsi husband 
they got only half the share in husband's property as per the Parsi personal law. Sharia law subjugated Muslim women by imposing parda and allowed polygamy and unilateral divorce by men to his wife or wives and by depriving divorced Muslim women of maintenance rights after polarization of religious on religious identities after Supreme Court of India's judgment on Shahbano case in 1986. Triple talaq became illegal in India on 1st August 2019 after five divorced women from different parts of the country, Shaira Bano, Ishrat Jahan, Gulshan Parveen, uh, Arfin uh, Rahman, Atiya Sabri, they filed public interest litigation under the banner of Bhartiya Muslim Mahila Andolan. And the PIL was titled as Muslim Women's Quest for Equality. Now, underlying philosophy of all personal law was that women are not equal. So we can't say that one personal law is more progressive than the other. But generally, like all of them, our family laws are governed by patriarchal ideology, they are irrespective of their religious backgrounds. These personal laws perpetuate patrilineage, patrilocality, double standards of sexual morality for men and women, and perceive women as a perpetual minor and dependent on men. Therefore, all personal laws on marriage, inheritance, guardianship of children discriminate against women in one form or the other. Individual women from different communities have challenged constitutional validity of discrimination in uh, discriminatory aspects of personal law. It all started with Mary Roy challenging Travancore Christian Eric, Lata Mittal and her sister challenging Hindu property rights, or Shah, uh, Shaina Sheikh challenging Sharia law and Shah Banu's case of maintenance, which created tremendous controversy. So we have seen that high court, Supreme Court session course in which women have challenged discriminatory aspects of uh, personal family laws. Increasing number of educated working women and housewives from all religious backgrounds have been approaching secular women's organization since 1980s. Main problem faced by a, a feminist organization is that the, from uh, these women from the nettle families have been fo uh, forced into marriage, murderous attacks take place in case of intercaste, interreligious uh, choice-based marriages and uh, property disputes, incest, loss of survival, based in case of husband's adultery or husband's bigamy or polygamy or desertion and divorce and custody of child and children have been major uh, uh, one of contention. As the issues of personal laws is intertwined with religious identities, the secular women's movements had to face tremendous hostility from vested interests of different communities, mass organizations and patriarchal secular lobby. Uh, and parliamentary parties cashing on block votes. Our country has more than 30,000 customary laws impacting destinies of women and girls. Laws, individual uh, uh, and individual women, whether they are divorced or deserted, or single or married under duress, are questioning discrimination in the customary laws. Tribal women in Maharashtra and Bihar filed petition demanding land rights in Supreme Court of India. Several women's groups like Saheli in Delhi, Limochna in uh, Bangalore, Swayam in Kolkata, Forum Against Women in uh, Oppression of Women in Mumbai, and human rights or, uh, or lawyers groups, and also Majlis and Lawyers Collective, India Center for Human Rights and Law, all of them and uh, Indian Social Institute, they also debated this issue extensively for over two decades. And now the, some of them have also prepared drafts containing technical details of gender just and secular family laws. It is in this historical backdrop, uh, feminist jurisprudence gained its prominence. Uh, one of the prominent lawyers of our country of, on feminist jurisprudence has been advocate Flavia Agnes co-founder of Majlis Legal Center, Mumbai, uh, and uh, she will be sharing her thoughts based on path-breaking contribution she has made towards feminist jurisprudence that has challenged gender biases within family laws. Over to Flavia Agnes. Thank you, Vivati, uh, for that uh, elaborate introduction to family laws uh, and how women's groups are engaged with it and how um, things are slowly moving to a more egalitarian system. So thank you very much. Uh, we just on the threshold of entering the 16 day 
violence against women fortnight declared by the UN. And this lecture happens to be coming in the eve of it. And uh, it addresses the issue of cruelty within matrimonial laws. Um, I just want to start with a framework of jurisprudence. Several feminist theorists have argued that the instrumental characterization of law as a tool for potential transformation of society is far too simplistic. They hold that law is a crude and limited device and is circumscribed by the dominant ideologies of the society in which it is produced. Existing beliefs and assumptions shape the content of a legal provision. Even when changes are successfully made, on a doctrinal level, they can and will fail if judges or, or others charged with the application of a new laws revert to interpretations that merely replicate old results. So though the law is changed in statute books, we cannot see its impact on the ground level. The impact of dominant ideologies on the shape and content of law and the legal processes makes the idea of progress to legal reforms problematic. There are several feminists who have written about it question, question this. For instance, Catherine McKinnon in 1989, Martha Feynman in 1995, Rajeshwari Sundarajan in 2003, Nivedita Menon in 2004, etc. Now, if you read them, you will find out that the limited role the law can play in changing women's lives. Since legal, moral, and social codes are administered to by hegemonic claims of patriarchy, an exploration into the notion of justice and fairness to women can be embarked upon only after piercing the veil of neutrality, neutrality, impartiality, and formal equality within law. When we examine women's rights, it becomes imperative to address the doctrinal concerns whether a woman-centric legal doctrine can be termed biased and lacking, in, lacking a neutral perspective. Can the lens of feminism or concern for women's rights be labeled as biased? Further, is there a framework of neutrality that prevails beyond it, which a legal scholar must edit? When we examine the development of law, we realize that due to the demands raised by the women's movement, women were added into the law project, particularly after women started claiming their rights as citizens within an overarching patriarchal system. The, the, uh, the demand by the, by the women's movement abroad was for equality, equality, right to vote, right to education, practice various professions, etc were hard-won battles for Western women. Influenced by these struggles, the Indian constitution guarantees equality under Article 14, non-discrimination under Article 15. Equality along with liberty and freedom form the pillars of our constitution to protect women. The right to vote, equality of opportunities for education and employment, equal pay for equal work, etc., fall within the notion of formal equality. But when we examine the domestic sphere under the matrimonial laws, this notion of equality has been detrimental to women. Since men and women within marriage are not equal, the same yardstick of equality cannot be applied. Equality can only be between equals. If the norm of equality is applied between unequals, it will, it, it will lead to greater disparity. But this distinction has not been clearly made within our matrimonial laws. This is most glaring when we examine the Hindu Marriage Act of 1955, enacted soon after the constitution came into effect. Women's status and role within marriage differs a great deal to that of men. The man is the breadwinner, the woman is the homemaker, and a contribution cannot be measured in the same economic yards. But at the time of divorce, the remedies for men and women are the same, adultery, desertion, cruelty, etc. 
but the incidents of cruelty, which men plead for the purpose of obtaining a divorce, vary a great deal to the incidents of uh, cruelty on which women base their uh, plea for divorce. It is like comparing oranges and apples. There is no comparison between the two. For instance, not preparing meals on time, not making tea when the husband returns from work, even when the wife is working. Uh, refusal to have sex, not respecting the uh, in-laws, not covering her head in the presence of in-laws or in public, refusal to wear a uh, sindur or nangal sutra, the sim symbols of marriage, neglecting to care for the children, demand for setting up a separate residence away from the joint family, filing a case under Section 498A of IPC, etc., are pleaded by husbands as instances of cruelty for seeking divorce. The grounds on which women base their petitions for divorce are vastly different. They address the basic issue of survival, refusal to provide maintenance, throwing her out of the matrimonial residence, or preventing her re-entry into the matrimonial home, constant demands for dowry, or insults to her parents for their incapacity to pay more dowry, denying custody or access to the children preventing her from uh, going out to work or taking away her salary, aspersions on a moral character, physical abuse, etc., are grounds on which the woman bases her petition for divorce. Within the patriarchal social structure and patrilineal residence, in most cases, the woman leaves her native family and comes to reside in her husband's home where we get the concept of a matrimonial residence, where until now, her right of residence was not recognized in law. When the wife goes to her native family for a delivery, the husband could easily prevent her re-entry and then plead the desertion. It took course a long time to develop the theory of constructive desertion. When a husband prevents his wife entry, so that when a wife, when a husband does not allow her to come, it is not she who is deserting, but it is he who is deserting her. So the theory of constructive desertion came much, much later. It was the husband's prerogative to decide the place of matrimonial residence. And if the wife took employment at a far off place, the husband could file for restitution of conjugal rights, in which force granted granted the plea on the ground that the husband is the lord and master and it is the wife's sacred duty to obey him and reside at the place chosen by him as a matrimonial residence. So either she would have a decree against her or give up a job. So these are the choices for her. It is taking a long time for courts to realize that the terms of cruelty, desertion, and anarchy hold very different meanings for the husband and for the wife. Despite this, we have a concept like misuse of 490. We have so much of cruelty happening. But when women file the case, even the courts make comments like the 490 is like a terrorist act. Women filing for this remedy amounts to terrorism. So it's legal terrorism, various kinds of comments that the courts make. The most disturbing feature of the Hindu Marriage Act is the right given to husbands to claim maintenance from the wife based on the notion of equality. So the law is equal, rights are equal, both can claim the same remedies. This was in 1955, when Hindu daughters were not given the right to co personally in their native family. There was great disparity between men and women in literacy, higher education, and gainful employment. The, the matrimonial laws governing other communities and even the Special Marriage Act did not have such a provision. So under any of these laws, a husband could not claim maintenance from his wife. 
only under the so called progressive hindu marriage act that the husband could claim or at least threaten her that if you do this or if you uh, do that and fight for divorce i will claim i will give up my job and claim maintenance from you but if she could not give up the job because she and the children de depended on her earning so when we see the equality in the matrimonial laws we confront all these biased attitudes now it took more than 60 years for us to realize the anomaly and to demand a separate gender specific law to protect women from domestic violence in fact the protection of women from domestic violence act has a detailed listing of all acts that constitute cruelty to women and there is no reciprocal reciprocal list which the men can use men cannot claim relief under this act now it took us a very very long time as i said 60 years from 1955 to 2005 to say there is no equality in marriage the cruelty is not the same for husband and wife we need a special law a gender specific law not based on equality but on specificity that one women go through and it's taken us a very long time and it's only now our post 2005 In 2005, two things happened. We got the Domestic Violence Act. We all Hindu women were daughters were declared co-partners in the family property. That is after 1956. Again, after 60 years, after a very very long battle, women or daughters were given the right to the joint family property. But even then, it took even more time, another like 20 years, to understand the meaning of it. That whether the If the father has died earlier, before the enactment, is she still entitled to a share in her father's property? That became clear only in I think two thousand eighteen, as, as late as that. The anomaly is even more stark when we examine the law of adultery under Section four ninety seven of IPC, which was finally struck down in September two thousand eighteen. by a constitutional bench in joseph shain versus union of india uh, i do not know how many of you are aware of this legal provision which was like which was there since the beginning of the ipc where a husband could sue a man who commits adultery with his wife section 497 along with section 1982 of crpc which is part of the 150 year old indian penal code essentially made adultery a crime for a man to have sexual intercourse with the wife of another man without the other man's consent ironically if the husband gave consent then there was no uh, crime and there is no punishment if the husband agrees that his wife can have if that man can have sex with his wife a similar recourse was not given to women women could not be the perpetrator of the uh, uh, perpetrators or victims of the crime of adultery it viewed her as a passive being incapable of making choices about her body or her sexual desires and presumed that her body belonged to her husband after marriage framed entirely within the framework of a man's world of the victorian era it viewed the problem to be between two men over the sexual access to the body of the wife though the law criminalized only men on the surface it looked that the uh, women are protected women are not affected by this but this provision was basically anti women it treated women as chattels and gave gave legal validity to the proprietorial rights of the husband over the wife while it on the on the surface looked like oh it is protective towards women actually it was derogative to women treated women as chattels any man who had sexual intercourse with her without his consent was perceived to be violating this right of the husband the supreme court has now endorsed this feminist analysis and struck down the offending section the bench observed that the parameters of fundamental right should include the right 
of women and that individual dignity was important in a sanctified society. The court felt that the law was against women who had no opportunity to defend themselves in a situation where they were falsely linked to a man on mere suspicion, since a woman could not be made party to the litigation. So it was as if she didn't exist. It was as if it's a relationship between men only. In an extremely, now how do you see this? How do legal experts see this? In an extremely short-sighted manner, in 2003, the Justice B.S. Malimat Committee recommended that making the provision gender neutral. That means there should be equality. When marriage is constructed in a patriarchal institution, the woman does not have the corresponding control over her husband's sexuality. Granting the husband additional powers to prosecute his wife for adultery would amount to adding salt to the festering wound. So, uh, this is the notion of equality. When you say neutrality or equality, how actually even legal experts or a high profile committee like the Malimath Committee viewed this? And that is what is shocking. Now, the set, when the case came up in 2018, the center had defended this provision using a deeply flawed argument that the section was essential to save the marriage, save the institution of marriage. Diluting the adultery law will impact the sanctity of marriage. Making adultery legal will uh, hurt marriage, marriage bonds. The center had declared in an affidavit filed before the court. It failed to see that the provision does not ensure marital fidelity. It merely protects male privileges. When adultery with the consent or connivance of the husband is not an offense, the patriarchal notion of the dimension of the husband over the woman's sexuality and bodily integrity is reinforced all the more. This was challenged time and again in, in different contexts. And each time the courts declined to strike it down based on a patern paternalistic notion of protecting women. These challenges were based on a two-way discrimination. The women's right to prosecute her husband and his lover for adultery. And the husband's right to prosecute his own adulterous wife. So there were cases like in 1954, Yusuf Abdul Aziz versus State of Bombay. In 1985, Samitri Vishnu versus Union of India, and later in V. Revati versus Union of India. Now, in V. Revati and Samitri, the women went to court and they said if the husband can sue the woman's lover, then the wife should be able to sue the, the woman husband is having an affair with. And that is equality of rights. Yusuf Abdul Aziz was based on uh, the uh, notion of equality, same as Joseph Chine, that I must be able to prosecute my own wife. If I can prosecute other men, why not my own wife? I'm just taking this example as a case study, how a legal provision, which appears to be to protect women, to uh, 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 frame within a Victorian sexual morality and a paternal, paternalistic value system, how it actually operates on the ground. I've had several cases where the women were so scared that the husbands will file against uh, another man saying that she's having an affair with him. And she's a silent person in this entire proceedings. Just give me a second. Hello? Yeah. So I think Flavia has brought in such an important aspect of how women being treated as infant. And uh, Sabiha Imran has also uh, commented on Flavia's discussion on adultery, that what about women's choice? And I think that's what I think you're answering. Yes. Uh, yes, Flavia, you're muted. Please unmute. Flavia, please unmute.
प्लीज अनम्यूट योर से यू आर स्टिल म्यूटेड या फाइन फाइन ओके सो आई जस्ट एंड विद दिस व्हाट द सुप्रीम कोर्ट हैज हेल्ड सो दैट गिव चांस टू अदर्स टू स्पीक फाइनली द सुप्रीम कोर्ट हैज लेड टू रेस्ट द फ्लॉड लॉजिक which has been uh, used repeatedly by not just the center but also the earlier rulings of the supreme court this is and the said sexuality cannot be constituted in a physical attribute and it it cannot be disassociated with human psychology he commented further that a woman loses her voice and autonomy after after entering marriage and autonomy is indicate to the dignified human existence So here it was not equality; it is human dignity, and that is what is interesting. Section four ninety seven denudes women from making choices, and held that this provision is a relic of the past. This is Indu Mal Malhotra, who was on the bench, held that section four ninety seven IPC is a clear violation of the fundamental rights granted to the in the Constitution, and there was there was no justification for the country uh, for the country to continue with this archaic provision. the bench held that uh, section 497 I, ipc is unconstitutional on the ground that this archaic provision violates the right uh, equality and destroys the dignity of women chief justice of uh, chief justice of india uh, this is uh, deepak mishra while reading out the judgment said equality is a governing principle of a system a husband is not the master of his wife the cdi held that legal subordination Of one sex by another cannot be permitted. But the bench observed that adultery can only be retained as a civil fault within the matrimonial law, and the parties to a marriage can invoke it as a ground for divorce. On the criminal side, near adultery cannot be a crime unless it attacks the scope of Section three zero six IPC, abetment to suicide. Where the wife's adultery becomes a cause for the husband to commit suicide. suicide. In such a case, both the uh, wife and the husband uh, and her partner are implicated, and the partner can be charged with Section three zero six, Red Act four ninety eight seven of the Indian Penal Code. For Justice B. Uh, Chandrachud, this is this is one more uh, landmark ruling after the privacy ruling, where he had discussed from the judgment of where he has dissented from the judgment of his uh, father. Chief Justice Y B Chandrachud, where he had held that privacy is a fundamental right. In this case, he dis dissented with the views of Senior Justice Chandrachud yeah. uh, in Samitri Vishnu case in nineteen eighty five, where the Supreme Court upheld the constitutional validity of this provision. So uh, here, I mean, uh, practicing advocates will give you a uh, much more thought in actually what happens in the court, how the courts view cruelty. how the courts view desertion and how the courts view adult one more aspect i want to bring here which is not written there is maintenance now the main in maintenance again men and women are seen equal but what is what is the economic in economic terms what a man earns is equated with a uh, uh, sexuality of the woman or the sexual impurity of the woman that if she is sexually not pure Uh, he, she can be denied maintenance it is does not depend on survival or her needs yeah. why and he has the money and she has sexuality so they are pitted against each other and we call that equality so how can this be equal when she is staying at home she is contributing to the domestic labor to, to, to the family economy he goes out and earns he has thrown her out now she is on the street Sometimes with the children, sometimes without, and then he to uh, in order to avoid paying maintenance, he continues to make allegations that she is having an affair, she is of a bad character. In order for him to escape from the liability of paying maintenance to her, so when we see each of these adultery, uh, cruelty, desertion, maintenance, you will see though it is said as equality. There is absolutely no equality in marriage laws at all. It's only now that we are thinking that we need special laws 
not based on equality but on special protection to women and on uh, on issues of gender specificity so for me uh, the way i see it is the missing violence act is a major departure which now these with a lot of issues dealt earlier with the matrimonial laws so now women can go to magistrate court they can they can claim maintenance they can claim child custody they can claim the right to decide in the matrimonial home which was not there in laws before this at all so in this context as we enter our uh, 16 day uh, campaign uh, on uh, violence against women i think this is a very important issue to flag that what is happening within matrimonial laws and how we need to move away from the notion that men and women are both equal under marriage laws and go into gender specific provisions within matrimony laws thank you yeah i think fravia you have brought in a very important concern about the when your social positioning is unequal how can the law treat them equally because that itself perpetuates inequality and marginalization uh, varshini ayer has asked a question uh, that i couldn't catch the case laws that ma'am ma just cited is there any way of citing uh, way citations could be posted in the chat box so if you can just post it on the chat box okay I don't have Now, a full citation i just have the uh, year of that Oh, but um, I'll see. I'm not very savvy with this medium, so I'm having a lot of problem. But yeah. I will put it in the chat. Yeah. Okay. So now I would like to turn to uh, Anuradha Kapoor, who has been a veteran feminist for three decades. Anuradha, you have worked. We have been actively involved in providing institutional support to women survivors of violence and discrimination in their personal and family lives. What? have been the experiences of swayam and uh, with regards to gender biases in the family laws and where do you place the protection of women from domestic violence act 2005 flavia just now said that it's a major departure from the existing gender biases in the uh, laws so over to anuradha uh, thank you uh, vibhuti and thank you to impri for having me here uh flavia and you have set out the context and i think that i will speak from a position of a practitioner yeah. somebody who has worked with women and to say that you know um one and what was something that uh, flavia herself actually uh, talked about which was there's one thing to have laws on paper but it's quite another to see how they implemented on the ground so the bias might not exist within the law but it also exists within the implementation of the law in various ways i mean it 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 um, it exists as a result of how the system itself is structured and the mindsets of the people who are actually involved in giving justice to women so whether it is uh, you know the um, the judges whether it is the courts or also this understanding of equality that uh, flavia talked about that whilst law is treating women as equal uh socially women are not equal so even if i need to access a law first of all do i know that a law exists for me do i know that my what are my rights who can i approach how can i approach it do i have the means to approach the law and do i have the social support to uh, approach the law i think these are all things that actually uh, talk to the point that flavia made is that there cannot be equality between unequals and women are unequal their access their understanding their um uh, you know the the financial uh, uh, ability all of these really are compromised and so law for women does not mean the same thing as law for men and so if a woman is going to court first of all how many women actually get there i mean in our experience not more than 20 to 25% of women who are facing and i'm talking about violence because our organization deals with uh, women who are support, uh, uh, we support women who are facing violence so when they are going into court um very few of them actually take access to law i mean and less than 20 to 25% are actually taking recourse to law and even there as flavia said i mean pwdva has played an extremely important role because it is actually it is a civil law which is giving women the right to maintenance right to protection right to custody right to residence which has been recognized as a specific right within this law and right to compensation so it's really talking about fulfilling women's needs when they are they are in situation of violence within the marital home or the natal home i mean here again the the understanding of domestic violence has been expanded to include women who are 
in um, in um, unmarried women in their parental home and also women who are living in um, uh, situations like marriage. So they're not married, but they are living with men as in the nature of marriage. So I think that the law has been a, a very uh, important departure as uh, Flavia had said, but I want to flag some of the implementation issues that have come up with the law, right? And how um, unequal uh, it is for women uh, in terms of when they are actually going into the courts. So the law actually said that women were supposed to get the first uh, notice was to be sent within three days and then you would get a final order within 16 days. This is what we had said because when a woman is in a situation uh, where she needs maintenance, she has to look after her child, she has to eat, um, she needs the money and most often they are dependent on the men, right? So this money cannot wait forever. You can't wait for five years before you get money to start eating, right? So the idea was to have a law that was um, uh, quick and it would give relief quickly to women. And that is not happening because courts don't look at domestic violence or women's needs in this as urgent enough. So you are still getting women who are for their first, the notice is being served in uh, under PWDVA six months. And the final, you know, the interim orders are taking a year. And final orders, we don't know, can take anything between two, three, four, five years. So that is a huge problem within the system itself. And then you have the, the issue about how are courts and uh, lawyers um, interacting with women. So what we see is women are not told, this, this infantilizing of women. Women are not told by their lawyers what how the case is going to progress, what is happening. You know, all the paperwork is kept with the lawyers. And when women will come to us and say, we filed a case and we asked them, okay, so what's happening in the case? They're not able to tell you because the lawyers haven't even bothered to explain to them what the case is about, where it's at, or even given them copies of their briefs. So this, this is the way, you know, a pro the problem arises. And then a lot of them don't have access to the means to be able to go to court. So you go through legal aid services, which is supposedly free. But then the lawyers who are there are not the same kind of level of lawyers that a man can employ. When he is fighting against his wife, he's employing the best lawyer in town. And he is pitted against a lawyer from the legal aid services who is basically not in any position to compare. So you're having that also as a huge issue of inequality between uh, you know, the man and woman when they're going into court. So that is, uh, you know, another issue. And also, I mean, I feel that if you look at some, when during COVID, what happened? Courts actually shut down, they went online. Here, what's happening is when you're going online and in, in Bengal, I can talk about where I was, um, you know, courts just didn't have the infrastructure. Even if the courts had the infrastructure, women didn't have access to internet and to, you know, uh, so again, you're, you're looking at inequality at this level. In the implementation itself, if you're going to say that the means by which you can get an order is to go through uh, the in, uh, through an online platform, how many women have access to that online platform? So that was, you know, another issue uh, to flag. And if you're looking at even, you know, how um, the law plays itself out, you have um, for women, for example, child custody, Usually it's expected that women are, uh, you know, the children will be with the women. But in some of the cases that we've dealt with, what has happened is women are thrown out of the house, as Flavia said, you know, you're thrown out of the house, but the child is retained. Now, once you're out of that house, for you to be able to get that child back means you have to go through a court system that takes forever. And if you have a small child, I mean, we had a case of a two and a half year old who was kept back, the woman was thrown out of the house. Now for her to even get access to see the child, it has taken over a year and a half, there's no order. Now that child has grown up. He doesn't recognize the mother. So this kind of inequality and this kind of uh, lack of understanding on the part of the court that you have to expedite these. This is also a big issue that is um, that women face. Yeah. yeah, and you need to tell me when to stop because I don't know how much time I have. Yeah, yeah. I can give you many yeah, uh, more examples. Another issue, there is a query yeah. from the uh, chat box also. Uh, Gunjan Chandok, she says, can you please share your views on marital rape? Okay. And so, how can we bring that in the main legal framework? Yeah, and marital rape doesn't actually exist, obviously, as a, as a 
I mean, we, it has been tried. We have tried to bring it into the legal framework, but that's not, uh, it's not yet accepted. And it's really uh, amazing that a man, um, you know, marital rape it, is something I feel really needs to be brought into the law because um, the kind of sexual abuse that women face within marriage uh, is, it's phenomenal. And it's almost as if once you get married, you give your, your body becomes the man's and you don't have a right to refuse it. Yeah. And as uh, uh, Flavia also pointed out, it's yeah. also a ground of cruelty that men use that my, my wife is refusing to sleep with me. It's a ground of cruelty and it's accepted by courts as a ground of cruelty. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that is a big issue that needs to be flagged. And more and more of late, we are seeing the kind of sexual violence that we used to see 20 years ago is very different from what we are seeing today within the family. And I feel, uh, you know, for example, I'll just give you an example of this man who was watching pornography, then putting a gun to his wife's head and saying, you have to repeat this act. Now, this is not considered as rape. I mean, how can we not consider that as rape? So we need to really, I think, work on this issue um, for sure. It's a legal license to men to, to do what they want with a woman's body. Thank you, Anuradha, for a very insightful uh, analysis as well as the case studies which you have discussed. Uh, I think I would like to supplement with what Anuradha said is about even when the woman is transferred, you know, the husband would want her to resign. And if she doesn't, yeah. then restitution of conjugal. There are courts after courts, high court sensation court, which has given a verdict in favor of husband that woman's prime duty is to be available to her husband. No? So that uh, is still that mindset is there. Say section of judiciary is progressive, but by and large, the judiciary takes a very, very uh, petri local petri. It, uh, it perpetuates the system of petri locality and petri lineation. And one more thing I want to say that I really find uh, problematic. And of course, you know, the Guardianship Act uh, there has been a change to say a mother is the legal guardian in the absence of the man. But what? why should it be? I mean, that is a huge problem. Why can the mother not be the guardian at the same equal platform? You give birth to the child and yet you are only going to be considered a guardian if the man is absent. So I think that is another big area that there is a gap as well as around property laws. I mean, Hindu women have uh, equality in property laws in paper. But actually, socially, we don't have that right. Because if a woman tries to ask for um, uh, uh, property rights from her in her natal family, she is deprived of any access to that family. So in in the, paper, one district magistrate sent a circular uh, uh -huh. and made it public that uh, uh, advising brothers on Rakhi that uh, first take undertaking from your sisters that they will not demand share in property. Yeah. And it officially it happened in Rajasthan, no? Just yeah, and, and one more thing I think that we need to flag here is marital property rights because a married woman, um, she has a right to residence. She has a right to maintenance if the marriage breaks down. And now I'm looking at a woman who's been married a long time has invested her entire life. And what we see now is like 20 years of marriage, men are finding younger women and they are divorcing their wives. What does she get at the end of it? Maintenance. Maintenance, right to residence and maintenance. Now maintenance, the problem is that today the man pays, okay? Tomorrow he doesn't pay. And the woman is constantly like, she has no right over the property that has been created over the marriage, this 20, 30 year, 10 year marriage, whatever property has been created, she has no right over that. She only has right to maintenance, which the man may or may not pay. And I think, the courts here have a problem because in Bengal, for sure, if a man pays one month and doesn't pay for three, then pays another month, no legal action, no criminal action is taken against him. Because they say, oh, he's paying. But the woman is supposed to starve for two months, then eat for one month, and then starve for another three months. So I think here, you know, what the judges think and how they are looking at women is also very clear. That women can manage whether or not they have enough, you know, um, uh, to survive on. I mean, they don't think of it as a survival issue. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and brother, uh, there, are, there are comments on the chat box. Be prepared for Q&A session. Uh, now I would like to ask uh, Sanchita Ayan uh, about uh, your, that you have defended the rights of minority institutions. Have you discussed the implications of discriminatory family laws in the lives of girls and women with these minority institutions, especially the decision makers in the minority communities? 
what type of responses have you received from the leaders of minority communities with regards to women's rights and some of the landmark judgments on religion-based family laws? It's a very sensitive issue, Sanjita. I would like thank to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so those who have heard me before would know that I tend to use my personal experiences and stories because as uh, Flavia Mem was just pointing out that law is a crude and limited device. So we need to look at, um, look at the context in which it, it operates. Uh, even in order to bring a change, we need to see if uh, how it is to be brought. If it has to be brought about, as well as how it has to be brought about, it's not to say it uh, it should not be done or should be done. We generally tend to say it in in a black and white manner, but but a lot goes in inside when we are actually looking at it from the uh, perspective of uh, of how to bring about a change. And I'm very glad that people have already covered those issues of gender biases in the law earlier so that I can now put those in the context and see uh, to what extent and how it, it actually operates in the system. Um, so uh, when I read uh, family law, I'm of course uh, reminded about uh, personal law and what it denotes to the communities. And uh, if uh, I am allowed to read uh, Salla Mudgal, so Salla Mudgal is a case uh, which was uh, pronounced uh, way back in 1995. And uh, if you look at the language, of course, all these cases say whether you, uh, the Hindu personal law was challenged or Muslim personal law was challenged, all these cases said, look, we cannot go into this, right? But uh, the language, if you look at the language, it says, Article 33 is based on the concept, uh, we, are, we are referring to, uh, Article 33 is based on the concept that there is no necessary connection between religion and personal law in a civilized society. Article 25 guarantees religious freedom, et cetera, et cetera. The personal of the Hindus, such as relating to marriage, succession and the like, have all a sacramental origin. In the same manner as in the case of the Muslims or the Christians. The Hindus, along with six Buddhists and Jains, have forsaken their sentiments in the cause of the national unity and integration. Some other communities would not, though the constitution enjoy, enjoins the establishment of a common civil court, court for the whole of the country. Now, this is how Salamudgal says, and, and if you look at uh, now, if you look at the triple talaq judgment, we look find it, it is developed in a in a positive manner, as in the court was looking at personal law as personal law, but uh, more in a legal context than associating some sort of sacramental value to it. So, to that extent, we have progressed even as a society, and that's what is reflected in the judgment. What about criminalization of Muslim men? Because when Hindu man deserts, nothing happens. How come just when Muslim man deserts, then he gets arrested? So that is what the feminists have asked. That how can uh, we have this Muslim kind of double standard? For Tala? Yeah. Oh, okay. So of course, so, uh, so that's a good point because when we went to court and, and just to give you a context as to uh, why we uh, as uh, lawyers went to court, because generally we tend to, uh, you know, represent other people, but this is uh, one of those rare occasions when we thought uh, we want to be heard. And uh, since, uh, you know, uh, nobody had briefed us to be very frank, nobody had briefed us. And then we thought, uh, we thought you know, but, but, but we have a point of view that we want to put across. Right, we want to uh, put across this point that, uh, firstly, of course, what the, what the judgment says, right? Exactly that point. And uh, the other one was uh, not to decide on uniform civil code. We had actually very, very categorically put that across as well. Um, uh, and uh, the issue was, now the, the whole uh, problem is that we never ever argued for criminalizing it. Once it's un unconstitutional, it was never part of the personal law, right? Because it's not recognized by Quran itself. So now to say that, oh, if you do this, we'll punish you, is, is more like, uh, I, I, I 
it doesn't serve any purpose except your political purpose right it, i don't think it even creates a bias i mean if you are refrain from saying a word thrice you don't say whether it's immoral whether it's it's it, it actually shouldn't have had any repercussion but now they are saying no you cannot say now then you you may say that this is not just a discrimination against men but a discrimination against muslims because hindus can say muslims cannot so it will go on and on there is no end to it uh, but i really feel that it was not required this law was not at all required but uh, but uh, the serious issue of gender bias we are considering at the moment is 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 much beyond than uh, criminalizing of uh, just uttering three words right which uh, uh may by the way uh, constitute cruelty so I, this for this reason i would like to go to uh, how uh, dissolution of muslim marriages act 1939 looks at grounds of divorce now many people think a oh, woman doesn't have a ground to for divorce in in muslim personal law right so just to put that in context so what had happened was in 1937 they came up with with uh, muslim uh, uh, it's it's called uh, Uh, i have a very bad brain fog after covid yeah muslim personal law sharia application act 1937 right which said notwithstanding any custom or usage to the contrary uh, personal law will be applied to muslims that's how we get the word personal right this is 1937 in 1939 the dissolution of muslim marriages act was passed which uh, the purpose of the uh, of passing the act was an act to consolidate and clarify the provisions of muslim law relating to suits for dissolution of marriage by women married under muslim law and to remove doubts as to the effect of renunciation of islam by a married muslim woman on her marriage right so basically what dissolution of muslim marriages act does it it, it provides for certain grounds to obtain decree and this is particularly for a woman right a woman married under muslim law shall be entitled to obtain because men already have it right so this was a code this is a codified law and i think we should we should popularize it more so that women also you know enforce their right under this law right because uh, the the general perception but there's a problem with this law as well uh, when it says Uh, unlike hindu law where cruelty is not defined right so it has its own problem that you know courts can interpret you know there can be bias associated with how uh, one person looks and there's, there's no uh, uh, of course supreme court has laid down certain um, standards that are now being followed but still it leaves a lot of discretion in the hands of the individual judges and this discretion is problematic because it's it's not like it will only go to women judges Uh, that's the reason why perhaps we need more of a uh, woman judges and also uh, we need uh, the bias to be removed because the uh, principal judge in a family court is and you you get promoted and then you become so there's something wrong with the with the way people get promoted in our country there's a definite gender, gender bias uh, there so perhaps that also needs to be looked at so that we have more uh, women judges in the family courts who can perhaps relate more and they won't have that bias this is, i think in, in initially in the process that's required once our society progresses etc then perhaps you know with every generation we will we'll prog- make that progress um so it says uh, that a husband treats her with cruelty that is to say habitually assaults her or makes her life miserable by cruelty of conduct even if such conduct does not amount to physical treatment so it includes both physical mental then associates with women of evil repute or leads an infamous life So look at the language. It's 1939, so it's it's clearly reflective. Attempts to force her to lead an immoral life, disposes her property, or prevents her exercising her legal rights over it. Because in Muslim law, you're also getting women is also getting from the father's side as well. I mean, they always had been. So uh, even uh, you know, preventing her from exercising those rights, obstructs her in the observance of her religious profession or practice. the last one because bigamy has also been an issue um or polygamy if he has more wives than one 
does not treat her equitably in accordance with the injunctions of the Quran. So this makes it further clear that the injunction, of, there's an injunction in the Quran which requires you to treat them equally. Right, so you can have up to four wives, but as a professor would say in class, that it's impossible to treat four wives or, or even more than one wife equally. It could only be done by somebody like Prophet Muhammad, etc. And therefore, it's actually saying you cannot do it. So, but the problem is, if a person is not treating them equally, then how do you get it enforced? Because if you're following the personal law, then because there's, there's no penal consequence, right? So uh, it only uh, helps you to get divorced. This law only helps you to get divorced. And then, of course, the uh, criminal law you have, and, and that's, that's common for everyone. There you have the uh, penal provisions. Uh, but then the provision of bigamy doesn't apply to Muslims, yeah. right? So, so but what is your experience? Is there a new thinking going on among the minority okay. communities so, about so the family laws and... Uh, Right. gender equality yeah. right so in that case let me share uh, with you uh, my uh, experiences starting from my college days which was a university right um so so when i went there i realized that a lot many practices uh, as in uh, when i see practices i mean when i went there there were not as many liberal spaces for women to to move about freely, forget about expressing their opinion on sexual. It, it was unsaid norm uh, that what good girls would do and what good girls won't do. And somehow I was conforming to them. Uh, beyond the point, it became difficult because then uh, even if uh, you are confident enough to answer questions in class, even that would be frowned upon. And it was like, there's something wrong in, in something, something very basic is wrong here. And what is that? Let me find out. Because you get accustomed, you know. You get, I am somebody who, who like really adapts to the situation, etc. Like, so I was like, let me um, let me see what's really wrong with this. And then I realized that 60, 70 percent of women are uh, trapped inside a women's college, which was meant for undergraduate non-professional courses. And I, I being in a professional course, I had the fortune to move around freely in the campus. They couldn't even come out of those four walls except on Sundays. So that uh, really made me think what will happen if they come out and I realized that it will create more liberal spaces in the campus. Um, and so I started thinking on those lines and I realized that uh, the thought that they cannot come out was so internalized, not just among those students, but also uh, in the event, even the progressive people who are like, you know, this can't happen here. I mean, you, you know, things, changes happen in JNU. It doesn't happen here. You have to wait till you turn 40 and stuff. And I just want to understand uh, that why uh, was it so, right? So then uh, I uh, I was reading, I was discussing. I realized that, of course, uh, with time I also realized the insecurities, right? And it's a very natural phenomenon to have. Even the Hindus had that insecurity there. Um, and uh, especially the locals, they were like, the moment something happens is because I'm, I'm a Hindu. And I had to tell them and to keep clarifying, it's not happening to me just because I'm a Hindu, there's, there's, there are other dimensions as well. Um, so I just thought that, uh, you know, let me uh, uh, look at it from, so I realized this much that, you know, women are the markers of identity. Like whichever culture you go, wherever you go, yours against mine right so if you have to inflict violence you uh, you rape uh, a woman of other country like that's what happens when when invasions would happen etc right so so that's what it was that you need to protect your woman and the more insecure a community is the more uh, i mean you know, those on women, women yeah. the fringes they need to protect because they have had in the name of protection women. women are restricted yeah, and right. girls are respected. That's right. So yeah. that's one minute. I would just, uh, Flavia would like to respond regarding yeah. the marital rape. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Flavia, please. Hello. There is going to be QA round. So can we first return to 
Audrey, because she has also has a very strong views on this issue, and she has been jumping to speak. So, Audrey, oh no, uh, actually, I'm in a I'm in a place. I was traveling, yeah. so no, I, I stopped, and I'm waiting. So I thought, let me yeah, finish. Yeah. I told you it was seven o'clock. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. What are the legal hurdles faced by majlis while fighting court oh. battles with regards to religion-based family laws and customary laws? Have you been able to win cases while representing aggrieved women from different religious groups? It's also, again, an extremely important uh, challenge that the women's movement has faced over the last 40 years. Yes. Yes, Audrey, please go ahead. Thank you, Vibhuti. Thank you so much for having me here. And um, I just want to say that uh, Majlis started almost 30 years ago. And at a time when we didn't have the Domestic Violence Act, we didn't have the reformed, uh, you know, the changed criminal law amendment. We didn't have the Child Sexual Offences Act. But we started with the premise that we would represent women in cases of domestic violence so that we would be feminist lawyers handholding them through this access to justice process. And uh, we've been doing that for 30 years. And in the process, we also started representing women in cases of sexual violence. Uh, so I speak from that experience and Majlis has handled almost a lakh and 50 cases in court of women either accessing their rights in matrimonial laws or under the Domestic Violence Act and even under the Sexual Violence Acts. So uh, just my first point is that, you know, I, I enjoy discussions on law and you know how they should be framed and how uh, we should write the law and what all the nuances should go into it and how, all kinds of you know let's put this clause so that you know if it's interpreted in this way this is how you know we'll, we'll cover ourselves so for example when we got the section 498a uh, for the first time in 1983 um, it criminalized uh, domestic violence for the first time and they actually introduced a new section in the IPC landmark, literally landmark, great appreciation. But um, the way they defined it was that um, if uh, a husband or his relatives had you know, committed cruelty on the wife, that led her to commit suicide. Look at the technical kind of insinuation that created so much cruelty that it kind of wanted her or made her feel like committing suicide. Uh, then it was um, a, a, a section under 498A could be um, could be applied. Uh, however, it defined domestic violence, uh, cruelty, and domestic violence as both physical and mental. Right now, my definition, and I would think most people here would agree that physical violence is, has a wide range. The way mental violence has a wide range. I wouldn't say mental violence is only if he's mentally saying something to her, but if he's emotionally abusive, if he's you know you know doing acts which are creating a strain on her mind, all that would be mental violence. Similarly, physical violence includes beating, but it also includes forceful sexual relation. It also includes forceful, uh, forcefully making her do acts of sex. So when you know, I, I'm addressing the first issue, which uh, which another which somebody in the audience brought up, saying, "What about marital rape?" So I just want to state here that the the section 498A way back in 1983 talked about didn't talk about it as clearly to say if a man sexually abuses his wife, then it, 498A will apply. But they were very clear that it's there. But what happened after that? Let's look at what happened after that. Firstly, when women started approaching the police saying my husband committed acts of you know, violence on me or cruelty on me and uh, he should be taken under 498A, there was a complete pushback because nobody thought incidents of domestic violence, definitely not the police, that this was a big issue. Like, how can you be talking about your, uh, you know, husband or their families? How, how can you be, you know, coming to the police station to talk about this kind of violence and shame on you? And suddenly from a victim who you were being oppressed, beaten, you know, all kinds of activities done on you, you became almost a, an accused. That how dare you come to the police station and complain about this violence? So, you know, often we hear this word section 498A is a misused law and we all get very, very upset and angry about it. But the reason it is used is because 
what they're trying to tell you is the fact that you are using it is the misuse. Because the act of coming to a police station and complaining about your family, and I want each of us to imagine our own family members, right? When we talk about law, we always imagine a dark, mystery, horrible abuser out there, but never somebody who's my father, my brother, my uncle, my, you know, whatever. Imagine them. So, and it's people like us that you're complaining to the police about. There is complete and utter kind of pushback to not record these cases. And, the, and, and what women have to face if they manage to record these cases is, is just the worst kind of oppression. It's worse than the probably the abuse they faced at home because they're constantly criticized and, and we have heard police criticize them. We have heard public criticize them. We have heard co-women criticize them. We have heard Supreme Court judges criticize them and call them almost accused. For were a child at that time in 1980. This was the major controversial issue we had in the first national conference on perspective for women's liberation movement in which even active women in the various social movements, they had also opposed marital rape to be criminalized. No, yeah. but, but the fact is that you could, if you were raped by your husband, you could bring it under this law. But how do you come to a police station and say it? Let us, if I, we have analyzed that much this, what do women say when they come and register cases under 498A? The maximum, the maximum cases that police would record was when there was dowry harassment. Because patriarchally, we can understand dowry because dowry pinches men. So dowry could be understood and hence all, almost always, either the woman is dead or that there is a dowry harassment and so that gets included and and mostly it will be dowry violence that will will then will then result in a 498a case getting recorded if it's normal beating that you know the things that flavia talked about beating uh, uh, you know doing other acts nobody cares and women themselves and i want to bring this point here again and again that talking about sexual abuse is one of the most difficult things in for a woman most difficult even when it is rape by stranger it is it is extremely difficult and we follow cases of rape and i can tell you like even today however progressive you may be when you have to go to the police station and talk about sexual abuse you are always kind of not being able to articulate what happened now imagine women talking about sexual abuse in marriage how will they articulate it what will they say and and the fact is they don't say it because in the hierarchy of violence, sexual abuse is very, very low. It is that when he doesn't give her money, when he makes her starve, when, when she's you know hungry, when her children are hungry, and when she's being beaten, that's when she comes, like physically beaten. We got the Domestic Violence Act in 2005. Domestic Violence Act left no stone unturned, and Anuradha is here, Flavia is here, Vibhuti is here, and you know, many, many other women who kind of participated feminist groups to 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 uh, write out this law, according to me, it's a law written by feminists and it's, it's, it's like the most progressive law that we have and has all, all possible um, uh, thought of how we can protect women's rights, right? No, no stone and turn, never heard of a law like this. It includes everything. And all service it is providers, clearly law. gives the mandate to service providers. Yeah, and it, and it puts women at the center and it talks about a civil law, but then we'll have criminal implications like unimaginable, amazing, right? But now let's see what happens. What happens on the ground and the cases that we are constantly representing is women are coming for the sole and only reason is maintenance. They're using this law for maintenance. They are not talking about sexual abuse, even though sexual abuse is defined so clearly in the law. But women don't want to talk about it. They talk about the domestic violence and then their maximum ask is maintenance. Now, remember, Vibhuti, maintenance is a right given to women before IPC under section 125 CRPC. So Majlis has always been using 125 CRPC and it is a law which is supposed to be quick. It's supposed to be a beneficial legislation which will give you immediate, immediate relief, right? And you don't need to like prove 100 different things. You just have to say, I am not capable of maintaining myself and he needs to maintain me. Now we get this law in 2005 called the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act. All of us are feeling so happy, so elated. But what is happening today, like Anuradha rightly said, I am getting court dates after three months. 
literally and then the next date the husband will not come the third date the judge will be absent because he has some bail remand applications so you're talking about one year for something to even move in court so when we are defining law and when we are articulating law while it is extremely important and a process to do what is happening on the ground is that nobody thinks domestic violence is serious nobody thinks that this is an issue that that we we say the right words if we come to meetings like this we'll all say that you know big issue big problem domestic violence but when it's on the ground nobody believes it and i'll tell you why i'm saying this is that the service providers the ngos every stakeholder and even within our feminist groups the the whole perspective and the whole outlook is save the family provide counseling try to reintegrate the family try to keep the family together because we don't have a state system that can that can help this woman outside of that family is the only institution that will provide so so keep the family intact for example when the family courts were set up it was a feminist demand it was a women's rights issue it was to protect women what ended up happening is the family courts actually in their act in their in their summary talk about saving the family yeah and that is the perspective they work with so when judges are forcing women to go back to their homes when are, when judges are accusing women of being uh, what what do you call um gold diggers if you claim maintenance you are a gold digger but i want to end with with you with something that was so disturbing that happened to me yesterday so as you know we also represent cases of sexual violence and the maximum cases we we do are on protection of children from sexual offences act because almost 80% are cases of children because of mandatory reporting now what's happening is these cases are heard in the sessions court and now look at the nuance between domestic violence and sexual abuse so our research tells us that any woman facing domestic violence a very natural integration to that you will see traces of sexual violence on children right because it doesn't sit in isolation he's beating her he's drinking he's doing all kinds of things to her and there is sexual abuse on children also but when these cases of sexual offence on children are recorded right and you know that these these may not be recorded because women want them they are recorded because of mandatory reporting the child reported in school the child was pregnant the child went to a hospital and then something came out and these cases get reported judges are time and again saying that these are manipulative women who are filing cases about are making forcing their children to file cases against their husbands because they you know there is something so 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 i sat in the sessions court yesterday and a sitting judge speaks to me with so much of elan and says you know audrey 98% of cases in my court all false yeah. all false cases and you're thinking how can they be false like what what is false about it because somebody has sexual relationship with a child the child is pregnant what somebody raped her because there is no consent up to 18 so what is happening and i feel what is happening is at one level we want more laws for women we are creating and trying to imagine more laws and now the current trend is let's get marital law you know we need marital rape to be but what is happening on the ground is constantly the 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 brick bat of this is being faced by women on the ground you got 498a they the women on the ground are facing the the weight of the misuse of 498 you got family law you said maintenance for women when women claim maintenance the reactions they get is that you are a gold digger that you know how dare you claim for maintenance and now you got child sexual offences act and where 80% of the cases are by known people people in the family it's not strangers who are raping these children it's people very very close to them their fathers their brothers their uncles their you know their uh, uh, brother in laws and it's all kept within the family and when you file a case then now young girls are being accused of misuse of these laws so i don't know you know where we are going with this whole feminist jurisprudence and how uh, you know gender justice is being practiced on the ground and there's such a vast uh, kind of problem there 
that before we can imagine any new laws, we really need to look at what happened to the laws that we got, what happened to the gains that we call victories. And we, we kind of, you know, you started the lecture with saying how Muslim women have like pushed the boundaries, how Christian women have pushed the boundaries. What is happening to those boundaries? Were those, are those boundaries being pushed? Are even what you imagine, is it really happening on the ground? And then what's going wrong so that we don't make the same mistakes? You know, we're repeatedly making the same mistakes. We're, we, we, all we're th thinking of is, how do I draft a better law? So we're not thinking of where is this going wrong? And, and, and what is happening on the ground so that these laws are not reaching women? And I can assure you as a practicing lawyer doing this for the past 15 years, it is not reaching women. It is just not reaching women. The, the, the concept is still save the marriage, provide counseling, send women back and just like, you know, try to manage the situation. Yeah. And we ha I'll end with a quote by our, I would call, I mean, people call her a feminist judge and she has been like a great supporter of some of the work that Majlis does. But when this case was being heard that should women, you know, like you said, there are so many stakeholders in the BV Act and so shouldn't these cases come directly to court and why is this whole process of counseling happening? She said that if, if, if every case of domestic violence came to court, the courts would be submerged. Merged. We couldn't handle it. So no, don't bring them to court. Deal with them at police stations. Deal with them at NGOs. Deal with them at panchayats. Don't bring them to court. Loka Dalit. Loka Dalit also. Anywhere. Don't come to court. We can't handle you. Because that's how many women would come to court asking for justice if they were given access. Okay. Thank you, Vibhuti. I'm yeah. going to shut my, my, my yeah, camera yeah. because like I'm traveling, but yeah. I can still hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So I think there has been volatile debate going on even in the chat box and there have been many, many responses. Those who are consistently co commenting are Gunjan, Sabiha Imran, Sakshi Sharda, Rushida Rebello and Manfred and Sir Oster. Would you like to speak and ask questions? Then I think the uh, uh, my panelists can respond. So first, Gunjan, are you there, Gunjan? And I request the panelists to go through the responses on the chat box. That massive response we have received on uh, your presentations. Gunjan, are you there? Sabiha Imran, would you like to speak? Sakshi Sharda. You are there. I can see you. Please unmute and speak. So I had a question. Sakshi? Bundle them together into one larger question. So I think the Indian. Hello? We can't hear you. stated picture. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Hello? Am I audible yeah. now? Now you are audible, yes. Yeah. So I think we forget that there is a male state now that is actually leading the... Yeah. So I think when we're drafting laws, one of the ma major mistakes that we make is that we forget that these laws at the end of the day are being read by the male, by representatives of what could be seen as a male state. And that patriarchal reading of laws does not give wiggle room to any kind of uh, jurisprudence which percolates to, say, the ground level. So if I could, when we're talking about maintenance also, one of the biggest hurdles that women face when they're seeking maintenance is the idea that they have to prove their chastity in court. They have to prove that they've been, uh, they have not, Adult, they have they, there has been no adultery during the marriage. They have to prove that they've been what is considered a devout wife, which then becomes another uh, subjective opinion for different court proceedings to understand it differently. And then the second thing that I want to bring about, especially because in towards the end we spoke about the POXO Act and we spoke about the sexual uh, assault and sexual crimes in our country. When we have embedded in our in, uh, penal code, a, distin a distinction between what is considered an outrage to modesty and what is considered sexual violence. Even feminist judges will not, cannot do anything much about it because then you have patriarchal, you have the patriarchal law embedded there. So 
even female judges are bounded with the patriarchal law at the end of the day and the recent judgment which faced a lot of outcry that had come was the that if a man uh, groups a woman while she's still clothed it wouldn't be considered a sexual violence because it uh, would fall under the category of uh, outrage of modesty judge. Yes. yes, and it was done by a female judge, the person who was there in the court at that point. And yes, actually, no, we had five, because... six very important Pokso judgment where the woman judge has been given a verdict in favor of a boy because he's the only player breadwinner or he has a whole future in front of him, no? And totally yes, sidetracking the pain and uh, brutality with uh, the pain of a victim and also brutality with which the act was conducted. No? So because that is still... women judges giving such. We also we had a demonstration have... in front of the court. <laughs> yeah. Rape is still understood only as an injury, and that injury is only considered as physical injury. Right. Somehow, the overall language of injury to the economy of the person is forgotten. And one of the biggest things that, like the most recent example, was a uh, uh, judgment in, I think, uh, I'm, I don't remember the high court where the boy was let go because he was supposed to be an asset to the country as he was doing his engineering. Yes. And the and the person IIT, that he IIT, IIT was boy from IIT. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yes, ma'am. So very brilliant in instances, academic record here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I guess, and these instances clearly prove that when there's a patriarchal reading of feminist jurisprudence and feminist laws, then even having great laws will not really bring into picture something which would percolate on the grassroots first. And second, the fact that increasing female participation, while that is has to be done, I'm not making a case against it. Um, what I'm simply saying is that even with increasing female participation and judges in the courtrooms, the patriarchal understanding of the state has not changed. Yeah, which is so by biologically being woman, you don't become gender just. Gender and just. So over to Flavia. Flavia has raised her hand for a long time and she would like to respond. Flavia, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vipiti. I can't see myself. I think what's happening. Yeah, we also see. can't see you. We can see your furniture, not you. Yeah. Okay, okay. What's happening? I don't know. Yes, please. Please go ahead. We can hear you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are two or three things that I want to, to respond to uh, what the panelists have said. Uh, the first thing I want to say about women lawyers. I think uh, Santika I said that more women lawyers than better justice. I totally disagree with. It's not a biological situation. That skin to skin judgment is a woman judge. Most imp more importantly, the Tehelka uh, judgment is also a woman judge. So what gives us the feeling that uh, women judges are better than male judges? I also want to make the point here, most women judges who get appointed are upper class, upper caste women who look down on lower class women, who lower caste women. And they tend to associate more with the question of class and caste. And we don't have a women from the lower caste or class or marginalized communities in our high courts. So women don't come into a category of biological women give better justice. And I've seen in the family court, the maintenance amount a woman judge gives is so much lower than a male judge on the same facts. So how do I account for it? And what basis are we saying this? That uh, women police are better, women judges are better, women this is better and that is better. It is your perspective that is important, not your yeah, biology, gender is. biology. So this yes. is one thing I want to respond to. And another thing I want to respond to, sorry, I'll just raise Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, another, another thing I want to respond to is uh, that um, Anuradha's comment about marital rape. In to be included, and you also made comments endorsing it. I have a major problem with this for various reasons. Because I feel the rape offense is framed in a very patriarchal language. It is a patriarchy. And here, uh, the, what it was earlier as a rape for a rape, eye for an eye, and things like that. And later, that or in riots and all, all the time, a rape of other women is our entitlement. So when a man rapes a woman, he defies her to an extent that she's not fit for marriage. For marriage, she has to be pure. She cannot be violated. It is never seen as a physical injury. It is seen as uh, she's the property of the community. She is the, uh, uh, her honor, uh, I mean, uh, 
famously Kamala Basin says that why you put your honor into our vagina? See, we never asked for it. So she is the honor, she is this, she is that, etc. But my concern is not that. My concern is why we, as feminists, are imbibing this very patriarchal framing of a rape and putting it in marriage. And being a victim of domestic violence myself, how, why do we think a violation of the vagina is on a pedestal? But if he breaks her head, or if he breaks her spine, or if he breaks her uh, bridge of her nose, or injures her permanently, that is less so. But if he, if he has sex with her violently, then that is a greater offense. And then a man having sex with the woman, with his own wife, does not have the same implication as another man having sex with this woman and defiling her. Because anyway, she's had sex before. What we are objecting to is not sex. What we are objecting to is the violence of the act. And the violence, whether it can be sexual, economic, whichever way, that has to be dealt with. And not, this, not the focus should not be on the sex. Because I, we have clients where they come and cry, the man does not have sex with them. Man does not even recognize them. Man threatens them that I can bring any other woman and have sex in front of you. So the sexual abuse can be of many, many different kinds. Whereas when rape happens, it seems like one, one time or some time, etc. But when marital violence happens, it is a continuum. And we need to like uh, look at it in this manner. And we cannot tell a woman, look, uh, your uh, ba backbone is broken, but that's not so important. That's you know, true. he did not rape you. If he had raped you, then he'll be under 376. But if he has not uh, raped you, but caused any other injury, One that is 498 uh, abuse. So yeah. according to me, we as feminists need to be very cautious. And I cannot imbibe the same notion of rape that patriarchy has given us. And, and the patriarchy has told us that rape is the more, worst kind of crime. The most we risk them. After rape, you are not fit for living. You have become zindalash. You are as good as dead. But what about domestic violence of all other kinds? Or what about economic violence? Yes. He is not giving money to send your children to school. Yeah. Imagine the violation that woman goes through. A woman feels which I have myself have gone through. Where this economic violence destroys your children. Destroys you. Not giving food. Starving to death. Each of them is the violence within marriage. So we cannot uh, put on a pedestal a patriarchal notion of violence and say, now that is not there and that is the biggest crime, biggest yeah. flaw. But uh, everything else is that doesn't matter. That is less so. Right. So it is up to us to bring it within the framework of Domestic Violence Act, 490 et etc. If you want, you can ask for increase in that. Yeah, but maybe a one thing that has happened recently is that after 2010, we are seeing increasing cases where the judgments are given, keeping into consideration women's unpaid care work, where the husband did not want to pay a penny. And we have seen so many, even with the, uh, under the lockdown also, this year also, we have got this. So that is one thinking that where gender economist and the analysis of time use survey, uh, all that has been used by the judges. <laughs> Also, yeah. there are uh, insurance cases where women's work was not valid. If she not work, she was getting less of a, 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 a less amount as uh, insurance money because her life was not worth. Yeah. So yeah. we have a lot of cases that have come in the realm of women uh, when a woman is uh, died in an accident, okay. and then uh, that her value or what is the value of her husband. Right. So this right. is a very important area that important. I think we need to yes, yes. Uh, address. But this is where I I I wanted. I know it's not a very popular argument and yeah. um, we would much rather have marital rape included in 376 and yeah. that exception to be taken away. But I, I would think if we ask for that, somewhere we are doing a great injustice to the entire issue or in a comprehensive way to the violence that women undergo to endure within marriage. It's much more severe than rape, but rape also. Yeah. So I, I all the time ask this, every student wants to do a research project on this. And every student ask, comes to me, 11, year, 11 standard, 12 standard, first year. I want to say, what do you know, understand about marriage? And they say, uh, you know, we have to write an essay on marital rape. That seems to be the most fashionable thing today for young students to get engaged with. And I wonder why, what's their interest? It's not their interest. The teachers are telling them, you write on marital rape, you write on marital rape. And yeah. they feel that I'll be the, first, uh, the right person because I will endorse it because I'm a feminist. 
and they get shocked when I say, no, I don't invest. No. Okay. Uh, okay. So now, now, I don't know if Sanchita has been waiting for a long time. Yeah, please go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. If I may clarify my position, just two lines. Yeah. Uh, of course, I agree with the uh, professor, uh, with the uh, Flavia ma'am and you and, and uh, others who said that, you know, the biology does not decide. I completely agree with that. When I said that, uh, you know, having a woman judge would help, it, it's based on my personal experience because uh, what we read in judgment is, of course, the outcome. But while arguing cases and while pushing for, you know, certain relief at a certain time, uh, I have found uh, a woman judges in Mahila court going out of way in hearing daily matters, like the other side is not there, like she's not willing to pass any order. I show her her photographs being put on a porn website, no evidence as to who has done it, but she immediately asked the police to, you know, investigate in the matter against the husband, right? So these kind of relief I've seen, it's, it's easier to push when there's a woman judge during the proceedings is what I have felt. And uh, secondly, I also feel sometimes women judges, women lawyers, all the women are put under a greater scrutiny to be better than men all the time. No, and they, but they also, they want to survive they in do. a man's world. So sometimes they are more man they are manly than men themselves. No, we have seen, maybe I, even, I used to be witness when you your case was being discussed in the Bombay High Court. And I have seen the women, women lawyers, they were trying to be more manly than men and giving so many judge, judgments which were given were harsher to women and they were more sympathetic to husbands. So we have, we have well, that happens when we yeah. argue and uh, when we... to you, I've seen some excellent male judges, excellent male oh, judges. Oh, They're not oh, even oh, horrible. Of course, I agree. That's why I said biology is a proper in sentence in English. But in a case of mine, where the ma mother tried to commit suicide and the child died in the process, and later they had another child and a husband had taken away the child. The child was not with us when we went to court. And I was ready to do anything, compromise, or, you know, at least continue temporary this, that, and the other. And the husband the family didn't agree. And finally, we went ahead and I got an order. The judge actually gave me the child back. And the judge was not looking at me. The judge was arguing only in Marathi. And he thought I was some like elitist person talking in English. And I was getting so angry with the judge. And he, I've never had this experience of the judge giving me custody in such a situation where allegation, allegation of murder of her own child, he was spending in this high court. And that was just amazing. It was just amazing. I, I Adorada, think, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I'd like to endorse what uh, Flavia is saying because our own experience has been that the biology of the judge really doesn't matter. Sure it depends on the ideology of the judge and whether or not and, and women judges can be even more patriarchal, it's true. And also they are going through similar things in their own lives. Correct. And what is happening is if I can take it, then why can't this woman take it? I'm seeing the same thing in the police stations where police women are all successful, police women, all successful women are extremely yeah. cruel so, and heartless when it comes to I, I, not, not to yeah, I, I'm not making that generalized comment, but I'm saying that what I have seen so the argument police, that if I could do it, why yeah. can't they? You know? Yeah, and the thing is, like at the police station, also when we go, we say we want more police women, but police women are unsafe within police stations, they leave by six o'clock. And so, you know, it's like uh, they themselves are not safe and they are also going through violence in their own homes. Their so own then when a woman is coming to her and saying this is what's happening, then she's not going to be, uh, you know, responsive because she says this is what's happening and what's the big deal. Right. So we really need to look at how people think rather. We've had fantastic people who are men who have actually responded to such situations. And in other situations, women have done that too, but it really depends on how how they perceive things. I think that's the that's ideology right. that they follow. And I think we need now, to address I would class and caste uh, uh, dimensions as well. But you know, when an upper class, upper caste woman sits there and a very poor marginalized woman comes before her, the contempt that she has is like something very, very disturbing. Very and I don't see it happening with judges coming from lower caste, rural background. That much more uh, diversity yeah. among the male judges than in the that's women that's judges. That's and unless you get that, just to say we have women judges, that's not that's not the issue. Correct. Yeah. Uh, now I would request Sabiha Imran. She has been waiting for a long and she has been writing in the chat box. Sabiha, would you like to speak? Please unmute and speak. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for giving me a chance. I'm very much uh, 
uh, agree with uh, what for flavia ma'am has talked about uh, it uh, related to economy uh, i'm uh, talking uh, with reference to triple talaq i have talked to many muslim women who are uh, victim of um, domestic violence and their husband every now and there they are threatening ki talaq de denge talaq de denge and when i asked them uh, isse pehle ki wo aapko chode aap chhod do the answer they gave all the time the majority uh, notion uh, the uh, what to say uh, con- uh, conclusion uh, drawn out of that is yahan se nikal gaye to jayenge kahan and i think uh, economic deprivation and the dependency uh, in terms of economy on the husband is the root cause as far as my knowledge is concerned uh, why muslim women are you know uh, taking this uh, baggage of uh, violence uh, domestic violence uh, from so long and one another submission i want to make is Uh, during my uh, P- right now i am collecting data for my phd i am a phd scholar in uh, sociology department sppu my first respondent told me her narrative and what comes out of her narrative is as a part of domestic violence uh, unki family ne unko ek case mein jhoote case mein within family unko jhoote case mein phaswa diya hai i mean this can be a Uh, a, a kind or a pattern of how your family can uh, make uh, uh, use their power or how they can you know hurt you that lady you know, was inside the prison almost for four and a half years yeah. my topic is about women prisoner so it is not only like uh, as far as family law is concerned the state is uh, gender bias it is inside the prison also ma'am and as far as my knowledge goes economy is very very important and yeah. about the uh, property law related to islam yes very true islam gave a property right to women but it is in the actual ground it is again similar with the hindu women ma'am no one wants to you know deprive from their maika so they never claim and if they claim also the family relation disturbs a lot yeah. that is the ground yeah. reality i understand yes yes thank you uh, thank you uh, 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 Sabiha, uh, now I request uh, Manfred Oster. Just quickly, if you can give your comments, Manfred, are you there? Uh, then Rushida Rebello, are you there? Advocate Rushida Rebello, would you like to speak? Otherwise, I will tell the panelists to uh, give the last comment, concluding remarks, one after another. Rushida, are you there? Okay, I think Rushida, you're here. You can do it, Sonia. She's working huh? with us. Rushila, please speak. Yeah. Rushila, are us. you there? She has written in the chat box. Uh, Manfred, yeah. uh, Manfred, you are there. Please unmute and speak. Yes, thank you very much for that. Um, yeah. And I might even just give you a view, um, trying that one. Uh, I just I just get the opportunity to thank you very much for a very, very uh, important and interesting discussion um, that, of course, for me as a foreigner in your country, This is quite enlightening. I, I'm a humble lawyer, my background as well. Um, but uh, therefore, I, I beg your understanding for some, some comments I put into the, into the chat box. Um, I, that I put into the check, check, chat box there, which might uh, feel a little, little bit alien to you. Um, but I thought uh, it, it might widen a little bit the, the, the perspective on, on some elements for me because of your answers to that. Um, once again, thank you very much for that. I think it's a very important uh, element and I hope that uh, there were also quite a few uh, male colleagues watching and listening to these deliberations. Thank, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. We appreciate your comments. And now Flavia, can you just say the last concluding remarks and the way forward for the women's movement as well as the citizens of India? Yeah, uh, I think uh, in the 80s, uh, we thought uh, justice would come if we have a uniform civil court. Over the period of three decades, we've come to realize what we need is a different perspective within each personal laws, as well as the procedural aspect of, uh, of the courts, uh, which Anuradha and Audrey and uh, the speaker referred to. And I think now when we need make laws, we need to uh, uh, be very clear where we are going to put this law. For instance, the POXO Act said give a time frame, uh, 60 days, something else, one year. And people are asking me why it's not happening because there are no courts, there are no judges, there's no infrastructure, nothing was sanctioned. Yet this law was enacted and everybody was happy. 
So I feel that now, uh, after so many years, since from 80s onwards to now, 40 years have gone by. Uh, and many of us have experiences of the court. We go to court, we fight for women. So our, our position has to be much more nuanced. Definitely. And we have to see the impact of law rather than framing a demand in a, in a perfect manner. So I think we, when we move ahead, we need to understand that. And uh, not really central here, but I think an issue that concerns me and what we do is that we see a lot of young girls. Young girls means as young as 12, 11, 13, 14 uh, are pregnant when the case is filed. And then the rigmarole and the, and, and the way one has to struggle to get go to the high court, get the medical board constituted, and something else run from pillar to post. And by the time it is too late and it becomes a live birth. When the live birth is there, the courts do not, uh, the, the hospitals do not discharge the young girl, 12 years, 13 years, so just delivered. But they keep her there till the infant is ready to be handed over to the child welfare committee. Now, this, according to me, is ultimate cruelty. Many of these situations are within the family, some of them within the neighborhood, and yet something so grave and so uh, horrifying, uh, we have not been able to address it. So when we have laws, we need to see what is the impact upon of the law upon different segments. And it is not the same, and their vulnerability is not the same. So we need to understand that and then have procedural changes or statutory changes as need, as based on our experience of dealing with this law. And I think these are small nuanced uh, changes will go far ahead in uh, getting justice to women and children than just having overarching law like a uniform city code or something like that. Yeah. Thank you, Flavia. Uh, the, what you have contributed from the experiences of last 40 years and also Majlis Day Today work of uh, protecting rights of girl, young girls. And also, thank you so much for the, me to accept this and do Manodaria, this. Manodaria scheme also, uh, your, your experience with Manodaria scheme is also very important. Now I would uh, ask Anuradha, can you give your concluding remarks and what, what is the way forward? There are many, you can see from the participants, there are law students, there are teachers, there are feminists uh, of three generations and there are citizens uh, in this uh, participant. What is your message for them? I uh, actually wanted to address two things. One is that somebody said it is economy that keeps women going <laughs> in uh, situations of violence uh, within marriages. I wanted to say it is only one of the things. I don't think that economy is the only thing. And I wanted to flag something that we haven't talked about. Laws don't work in court, but they also don't work for women because they don't have social support. They don't have family support. And I think we really need to flag that issue that if a woman wants to go to court and she has, if it is violence, a marital uh, violence, and she has her parental family support, that is one of the biggest things that can actually help her in fighting for her rights and accessing the rights. And I think this is one area that if I were to go forward, I would say social change is required. When you want laws to function, you also have to have social change going with it because laws are usually way ahead of what society is actually thinking today. So I think that is one big area that we need to work on. And if we want to really uh, focus on something, I would say no more laws. I would say implementation of the laws. How are we going to ensure that what exists actually works for women? And that women get justice through the system, which means we need changes in mindsets of the protection officer who is helping a woman who's telling that woman, why aren't you going back? Why? This whole business of keeping the marriage together, this has to change. Violence is unacceptable. Whether a marriage breaks or not is not the issue. The issue is, is the woman safe? Is the woman allowed to live a violence-free life? That should be our goal. She has to be able to live that. And I think that change in mindsets has to come from within every single stakeholder, whether it's a protection officer, whether it is a lawyer, whether it is a, a judge, whether it is a... Uh, police officer, whether it is our, uh, you know, NGOs, whether it is, you know, uh, family welfare uh, organizations, all of these have to change. And I think that's where our focus needs to be. How do we change mindsets so that the actual experience of a woman going into court and asking for justice works in her favor? And there's not a judge who tells her, I mean, I'll just share an example of a judge who 
um we had a woman who came to us her, her husband tried to kill her three times three times and she had to go back because she had no family support and the third time when she came to us after that and we convinced her to leave and we convinced her parents her family not we didn't convince her to leave we convinced her family to allow her to leave because she wasn't being allowed to leave and they agreed and then finally she filed for divorce and she go, went to court and the judge told her to go back and try one more time now when that happens to a woman how do you expect her to get justice and i think that's where the focus for us in the future needs to be excellent yeah yeah most important now sanchita what would you like to say yeah so yes. uh, one is that all these laws are aimed at uh, you know achieving substantive equality so i think that's important while deciding these cases as to whether that may be a test to to you know see if the law is being effectively implemented or not so when dvr came the purpose was also to give a quick remedy right because police was ineffective so you had a even when the family courts act family courts came we were, it was a quick remedy because earlier we men had to wait for 15 20 years and the women demanded of, separate court right family courts remedy is not that of so urgent nature as this is like this is like threat to my life threat to, and police is not doing anything and that's why you have a court you know to look into it and to have protection officers all these mechanisms are amazing and uh, the problem is even the judge takes so long to pass one order even an interim order i mean every to... women's issues can wait that has been the policy police also says that we have a case so of drug trafficking we have a case of a murder so we can't take up a uh, Woman's case, no. So that yeah. yeah. So my client was asked me, someone hits me on the road, they'll register an FIR. Just because my husband has hit me, they can't register an FIR. They want to just sit right. and make me talk to him and say, "Why wait for that?" Right? Because one of the Sorry. reasons of an FIR or of such measures is to this prevention as well, right? Because once it's it's registered, it's like it also creates a. So when that was not happening, you didn't have a court to pass protection order. to pass just a protection order that just says oh you are restrained just to pass that order the court takes so long that it's very frustrating because that order in itself again does nothing then you have to get it enforced you have to go to the same police to get it enforced right so that's the problem which didn't come when they because the first thing they would have done was to call 100 didn't help and therefore they moved the court right um yeah. so so that's definitely an aspect uh, and uh, then of course uh, the other one is the you know integration of uh, of the law if if at all that's uh, done in the future but uh, for that because if we have this sacramental notion associated with each of the personal laws reforms don't happen so uh, i i don't know like separate uh, you know that can also be done along with that that perhaps a sort of integration is something we are looking in in the future but uh, of course that's going to take time and till then uh, certain reforms within the societies would be necessary to change the mindset uh, and uh, as uh, i think uh, the minority education status plays an important role there because then it's uh, it helps in education of certain women who would otherwise be deprived from getting education that would bring a change yes. and you also think uh, increasing the representation if now if i can put it that way in for that you need gender responsive budgeting for all the laws whether it is pcp and dt act anuradha has also mentioned the pcp and dt act or powda because this uh, domestic violence prevention of domestic violence act has important role for service providers protection officer counseling shelter and uh, immediate uh, emergency needs of a woman survivor of violence how do you how you going to do that for that you need a uh, massive But, budget so i think all state government except for andhra pradesh no other government has even allocated separate gender responsive budgeting for right. implementation of all and the programs i also think that increasing the representation of women is definitely i am not asking for reservation but i'm saying 
as we go ahead and we have increased representation of women in all strata of judiciary things are going to improve mindsets are going to get better so because now we are critical minimum yeah critical Just minimum if one or two women would become men's women but if you are have 33 percent 40 percent 50 percent moral pressure on them to to represent women's interest yeah so sanjita yeah, now I'm not saying we will essentially but but that will make a difference because now the judges are not being asked just as Leela said was asked this question whether you'll be listening to your husband all the time while making decisions now these questions don't even occur to the judges she was asked to take care of tea for the judges yeah, now, yeah. That, that was happening. Even that. in the UN, it used to happen, and women had to shout, I don't make tea, I make policy. So we have to assert ourselves, and that can happen only when there are more in number. There is always strength in number. That's what the feminist movement has always said. Now, last word, Audrey, what would you like to say? Audrey, please unmute. Huh. Thanks, Vibhuti. Uh, I don't know if my uh, internet is clear, but I'll try and say, uh, say something. Uh, my first thing is that because there are young lawyers in this group, I would encourage all of you to please spend some time in courtrooms helping women, representing even one woman to just go through this whole process and be there. Like Anuradha says, that it is only through support that women can access justice and we all have a role to play. Our right. family has a role to play, but also you as young lawyers you know, the whole idea is we are having more and more women come into law schools. They're coming for internships, maybe to Anuradha's organization, to Majlis. But in the end, they are not entering courtrooms. They're doing, you know, other work. So we need young lawyers, both men and women, to have minimum number of years just doing some kind of litigation for marginalized people so that they experience courtrooms and they understand what is the need. So even when you're making policy, you're doing that with a perspective and an understanding of ground realities. Yeah. My second and very, very important message to policymakers is refrain from these big, big, huge, gigantic kind of broad stroke laws and work at the nuances, work at procedure, work at what is going wrong. And I'll give you one example, which I feel has created such a problem uh, under the protection of women from Domestic Violence Act. The whole, the whole comment has been, uh, police do not work. And we should have stood strong to say, if police do not work, make them work. If everyone else we can make work, why couldn't we make the police work? Because at the end of the day, look at the budget that police get. Look how they reach the smallest town and village, and they are the first point of contact, whether you like it or not. What we did in the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act is we created this new job called the protection officer. Yeah. Now, the entire feminist group are spending hours of discussion on how the protection officer will be appointed, how will we give them budgets, how will we have more of them, and I, I believe, genuinely, it will take us 100 years to get there. And by that time, they will already be corrupt, they will already be insensitive to women, they will there will be all sorts no, of so problems. The question is of social accountability that can come Absolutely. when everyone stops being indifferent to the issue of gender-based violence. And here, when Virginia Saldana, a veteran feminist, says that we need to campaign to get graded women's studies introduced in the compulsory subject in schools to change attitudes towards women and girls. And another very important suggestion that has come is that well-designed training program for all implementing personnel. Training can include case studies and persons that Currently speaking, they walk with the victim, and this can be uh, uh, this can be a training. I think in, during 80s and 90s we had that. Now it has stopped. So I think we need to bring back that culture of uh, training of all the implementation structures and mechanisms which are uh, implementing the laws and as well as providing support to the survivor of violence. Now we are at the end of the program and I would like to conclude that today's discussion based on grounded intersectional reality has made convincing case in favor of institutionalization of feminist jurisprudence. Uh, it is the laws neutrality that is a, uh, as the very mechanism that perpetuates injustices against women. Feminist jurisprudence challenges the existing legal status by focusing on what kind of institutions and laws would be necessary to redress imbalance against women in society. 
feminist jurists like Flavia and activists like Anuradha and uh, Audrey and Sanchita, uh, they, as a lawyer, they question the discrimination in the legal system and argue that we must look at the norms embedded in our legal system and rethink the law. What, whatever is injurious to women's rights and dignity must go. Gender responsive alternatives must be brought in. Uh, rethinking constitutional law is a manner in a manner that addresses and reflects feminist thoughts and experiences. It also explores the relationship between constitutional law and family uh, feminism by examining, challenging, and redefining very idea of constitutionalism from a feminist perspective. A feminist constitutionalism, which is now get, gaining increasing popularity among the young law students, demands that we not only revisit classical topics from new perspectives, but more importantly, pose new questions, introduce new themes, matters, and subjects, and take responsibility for changing focus of legal discussion and debate. I thank all four experts, Advocate Flavia Agnes, Ms. Anuradha Kapoor, Advocate Sanchita Ayan, Advocate uh, Audrey Develo for enlightening us about their journey to justice and creative use of legal system for not only safeguarding women's interests, but also expanding the horizons of gender justice. Thank you all. And I would like to thank once again, Dr. Arjun Kumar, Swati Solanki, Sakshi Sarda, over to the Impre team. Thank you, Professor Viputi Patel for uh, excellently summing up this excellent and thought provoking session. Uh, this has really been uh, very uh, heartening and heart touching and also uh, so many things that require um, uh, immediate action. Uh, so that we actually move towards an inclusive society wherein the voices of women are no longer are subjected to the uh, sidelines or they are longer marginalized. So thank you so much. I would like to propose the formal vote of thanks on behalf of the Inri Gender Impact Studies Center. Um, speaker, uh, Flavia Agnes, ma'am, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your wonderful, for sharing your wonderful thoughts. We have learned uh, enormously from you. I would like to thank all our uh, esteemed panelists for today. Uh, Anuradha, ma'am, uh, Audrey de Mello, ma'am, uh, Sanchita, hi, uh, good to see you again. Thank you so much, um, Sahiba Imran. Um, and Consul General uh, of Kolkata, from Kolkata, uh, Manfred Oster. Uh, thank you, sir, for joining us uh, this evening. And um, thank you to all our participants for joining us and for listening to this excellent set of insights, which actually keeps the ball rolling. And also to reiterate what our panelists have said, we do not want more laws, perhaps we want is implementation of the existing laws. So thank you so much. And I would like to thank everyone who has been listening to us um, on uh, Facebook Live and here on Zoom, and also to all those who would be watching us later on YouTube and listening to our podcasts. So thank you, and I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. <laughs>